Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the Eastern Border. Uh, this episode is going to be about the 1905 revolution, which I shall discuss with my colleague from Inward Empire podcast, uh, Sam Davis, because he recently finished his series on the 1877 Great Strike in America. See, Inward Empire is a podcast which does approximately the same thing that I do with the Soviet Union, except he does it with America and tries to answer the identity questions of America about what makes America American. And so we're, we're related in, in the subject matter, so to speak. And he's also a really good friend and a competent person. Seeing as he did his 1877 series, I wanted, of course, to involve him in my discussion on this project and discuss the 1905 revolution just to compare and contrast these things and maybe talk about the political zeitgeist on the moment. You see, he... He wasn't available later, so basically I have to do this right now, and you will get the Lennon's episode, what he did between the childhood and 1905, and a bit more onwards, because it will be a bit more, bit more onwards and next episode. So next episode will be back more, focusing just on specifically Lennon, and this time it will be, this episode will be about one of the least known revolutions in the United States, as far as I, I know, as far as I have heard around on the internet, uh, around the revolution of 1905, which is a truly bloody event. So, give this a listen, and don't worry, we shall be back with much more detail on Lenin himself. Enjoy the show. So, hi Sam, I guess it's the second time for you being here, the first time the listeners hear you, mind you. <laughs> yeah, that's right, it feels really good to be back and uh, having another one of these dual conversations of ours, a little crossover. Well, you know, uh, you'll, you'll hear the first one that we had recorded in uh, a while ago, <laughs> in July, I presume. Uh, it'll come at the time where I'll, where I'll need more time for research, I presume, or, or Sam needs more time for research, or something like that. <laughs> Anyway, we are here to talk about the revolution of 1905 in Russia and, you know, how it ties in to 1877 workers' strike, because I like to compare things, and we also called it here, like, a general strike here, but the circumstance of, of how all this happened was, well, extremely different, actually. I th actually think that what happened in 1877 in the United States was actually more communistic than what happened in 1905 in Russia. Which is very strange. Yeah, so I think this is going to be a really interesting comparison because basically what you have are two failed revolutions. You know, the differences in terms of uh, not just location, but also, you know, intent, the kinds of people who were involved. I, uh, I find that stuff really interesting. So... You know, hopefully we'll be able to find some interesting like crossovers and uh, some interesting contrasts as well, just in the two different contexts of, uh, you know, Russia in 1905 versus U.S. in 1877. Yeah, well, I don't know. Well, the United States in 1877 just hasn't come out of, just come out of a war, which, by the way, Russia has, and Russia lost the Russo-Japanese War, which... Tsar Alexander the... Oh, was it the second or the third? <clears throat> it's the second. Yeah, it's Alexander the second. So, Tsar Alexander had decided in 1904 that basically... Well, Tsar Alexander decided, hey, Russia is like a, a backwards country and, and everyone's poor and everyone's, everyone feels bad. So, hey, let's have a quick, uh, very successful foreign war, and let's use the success in that war to show, the, show to the people who are completely poor that Russia is actually really great. Hey, does that remind you of anything? Uh, but yeah, yeah this, is, this is the traditional way of doing things. Well, the Japanese by this point had, uh, had gone through their reforms and promptly were beating Russia's ass. And uh, this is where your kind of guy, and apparently Daniel, Daniel Bolelli's kind of guy as well lately comes in. Because, uh, yeah, for the ending of this war, Teddy Roosevelt, the most badass president of the United States ever, uh, kind of got his Nobel Peace Prize. 
even though that is really weird, Teddy Roosevelt is a weird character to have a, like, Nobel Peace Prize, I think. So, basically, the thing is, kind of, re only recently, relatively recently, uh, the serfdom had been abolished. Uh, but it, was, uh, it wasn't abolished completely, as you might think. I mean, I don't know, uh, when you abolish slavery in the United States, were the slaves given the rights to own property? Because that's, that's, the, that's the thing that I want to compare. Yeah, sure. So actually, this comparison between serfdom in Russia and slavery in the U.S. is a really interesting one. Uh, uh, what was the year for the abolition of serfdom? It actually varied. Really, it was, it was weird. Because, uh, basically, even though any revolts, revolts were weird, basically partial, partial kind of liberation of, of uh, the serfs happened in 1861. But in some parts of the empire, uh, it happened only in 1870. It, it, was, it was just weird, for one. Because uh, Russian empire wasn't a monotonous blob. It's it, like Russia is a federation too, just like United States. You just don't think of it that way. And a lot of people over here in these parts don't think of United States as, you know, having states. They just think, you know, states are just the same as administrative districts over here. So, you know, but there's a huge difference. And uh, Alexander II was kind of a reformer czar. And yeah, by the way, we're, we're talking about the period 1861 is nine years before the birth of Lenin. So we're we're mixing out here, but we'll manage. Uh, but yeah, anyway, he he kind of abolished serfdom, but all the farmlands and all the buildings and everything it all was still owned by the kind of the lesser nobility. I, I don't know. It's a it's it's a special case here in Russia, which I mentioned in my first episode on the Lenin, because. You had to become a no. After, after you served enough ranks as a civil bu bureaucrat, you basically were assigned a noble status. So, for example, Lenin's Lenin's father actually managed to just you know he he served enough time as a just a clerk a as a bureaucrat, and his rank as this bureaucrat demanded he would be a noble. So he becomes a noble. He gets ennobled. And he gets enough cash, and then he just goes out and buys a village with everything in it, including people. So it's like 19th century weirdness. It's feudal bureaucracy, because, you know, all, all the reforms in the Western Europe, which happened in the French Revolution, no, never happened. We have feudalism and bureaucracy. It goes hand in hand, apparently. So yeah, uh, but the peasants now free peasants still had to buy their uh, their own homes and, and land they they were like they used to live in this house and work this land and the serve them meant that they couldn't leave the village and they were tied to the land but they could live in this house and they could work their fields but now they had to buy them so what happens quite often when you instantly liberate a bunch of people is that, you know, a lot of people just become debt slaves, you know, debt servants, apparently. Which caused a bit of a ruckus, but really people decided that, you know, we they, they'll just endure. That, that's, that's national motif, by the way. Uh, there's this uh, famous uh, song of the Volga Boatman, and it's all about the fact that the Russian person, Russian Russian guy endures, essentially. And uh, at the same time, oh, by the way, no, uh, in, in the, the Russo-Japanese War, it was Alexander III, because Alexander II dies in 1881. Oh, well, can't be him then, unless it's zombie Alexander. Oh, well, he was pretty much a zombie there. Alexander III really <laughs> hated the, the assassination of, of, his, uh, of his previous czar, so he just stopped the reforms. Because Alexander II wanted wanted for the Russian Empire to actually grow. He was a very progressive person. Well, for a Russian Tsar, because uh, they were... because he tried to do some reforms. Like, actually reform the government a bit, do some modernization, actually, you know, build some railroads, do some things, just, just to modernize the country. The problem was that actually a lot of, uh, of the new 
like peasants and and all the like lower classes they were kind of against these reforms because tr power tradition is very strong there because by this point 19th century russia like pre-revolution russia and 19th century consists of like 97 percent of people who are illiterate for the most part uh, peasants just don't learn how to read or write or something uh, they're illiterate and they're like the un the unwashed masses, so to speak. Literally, they are the proletariat. And then there are the three percent of the intelligentsia who live who are like the nobility, and you know a lot of them live in Saint Petersburg. But that that intelligentsia will basically um, okay. Imagine this: uh, these guys were kind of if you would compare them to to the French noble at the same time that Russian guy would outclass the French noble and French grandma literature and everything. They were, like, super educated. And, weirdly enough, these 3% were often the guys from whom the reforms came. Because the farmers were so downtrodden all over this huge, huge, vast amount of, of time, which is kind of... You know, I, I don't know how Americans would, would think of this, because people in the Russian Empire had been serfs for a longer time than America had been, exi had been existing, even, okay? Uh, even though, traditionally, it's considered that Peter the Great kind of really strengthened the serfdom, but it existed previously also. Okay? It just wasn't enforced by Russian... Um, um, by the imperial government, it was enforced by the local nobility, at least in, in these parts. So up until this point, the reforms kind of end. Uh, when when Alexander II dies, he starts these reforms. People are already grumbling, and and this is where, this is where everything starts to kind of boil. And the local farmers, I mean, in, in your story, which I listen to and I recommend everyone does because it's amazing. Um, in in your story, they kind of you know you spoke about these communes, right? These little, like, uh, little workers' towns, I suppose, the smaller, smaller towns where people were, well, were just knew each other. Well, some, something similar to this was also in, in Russian peasant communities, because, for example, over here in Latvia, we had traditional farms which were separated very, very far from each other. Latvians don't like other Latvians. In Russia, it's more like you have this one densely, densely packed village, then you have nothing for a while, and then you have another densely, densely packed village. So they had this feeling of community and, and, and feeling of what's proper and what's nice, what, what's right, and they really lived on these traditions. And by the way, uh, uh, during all of this period, there is this one extremely interesting uh, thing that I don't think happens anywhere else, is that there's always this view throughout Russia that, you know, Tsar is always the right guy. Tsar is our father. He's like, you know, Batyushka Tsar is, is the local kind of term for it. I don't know how to It's like, kind father the Tsar. But, you know, we're oppressed and we're poor and we don't have anything to eat because, you know, he's sitting up there in his high tower on the throne and he has terrible, terrible, terrible oppressive nobles around him who give him bad advice, not all evil. Now, if only Tsar would really know how we live, we would be much, much better off. It's weird. Tsar never gets blamed for this. Like, up until, up until Bolsheviks take power, Tsar never gets blamed for this. Therefore, even though people are oppressed, they, 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 there were some reforms, but then they get cut off. And they got really cut off after Nico after Alexander the Third, you know, after people tried to assassinate Alexander the Third. Namely, Lenin's older brother tries to assassinate Alexander the Third together with his buddies, but gets you know stopped. So the workers are there. Everything's kind of kind of peaceful, but you know there there's this grumbling, just just you know low low simmering, as Dan Carlin would like to say. And then Russo-Japanese War happens. Because, as usual, as very traditional in Russia, you have to have a war against the foreign enemy to show that, you know, oh, who cares that you don't have nothing to eat? Russia is great. Nobody cares. Then the war ends, and troubles really, really start to take off. Okay, so maybe this would be a good place to pause for a minute. Yeah, this, um, is, this, because... is, this is leading up to the revolution, and, and 
And so you, you, you go on with, with your leading up to things in comparison. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is fascinating the way that you frame this because, you know, one of the big uh, kind of booming areas in, I guess, all fields of historical study in the States and I guess, you know, Europe as well is this comparative history thing where you look at multiple countries, multiple regions um, in one time period and you try to see, you know, what is going on here, right? Um, and the idea is to see that there are these trends that are unfolding across multiple nations at the same time. And you can't really understand the history of one country in isolation without looking at the big picture about what's going on globally, right? So I think this is really interesting. And um, as you tell this story about, you know, what's leading up to this revolution in 1905, there are so many things that pop out at me for similarities uh, with what's going on in the U.S. So, I mean, one of the really interesting coincidences is, you know, what you mentioned about the emancipation of the serfs, right? And the, the end of serfdom which is in the 1860s, the same as the end of slavery in the U.S., right? But out of that system, out of this, in the, this time of, you know, what on paper is this time of reform and, you know, liberalizing and uh, industrializing and modernizing and all of these big processes. Um, By the way, what, what, what has to be mentioned is that uh, at least in Europe, and I, I'm pretty sure in in the United States, 1848 is in like living memory of, the, of people. Sure, you know? sure. Um, you want to fill people in on what happens in 1848, just uh, just briefly? Oh, oh, um, <clears throat> massive, massive Jacobin uprisings everywhere. Uh, people who play Victoria too feel terrible, terrible pain. Um, <laughs> assassinations, mobs take over, mobs take over places. It really requires the whole episode on that. Just that. Because really, if you think that, you know, collapse of the Soviet Union was, like, big with, like, all of us splitting off from this and this country collapsing, well, in 1814-8, imagine, imagine every little place around Europe trying to rise up because of the ideals of the French Revolution. It, it fails at some places, doesn't fail at others. Well, doesn't fail that bad. At other, uh, uh, and especially in Germany, in Prussia, that thing gets turned turned somehow into pan-German nationalism, which does weird things. It certainly does, yeah. So, um, you know, in the first part of my series on 1877, I talk about the Paris Commune. Um, and it's, it's worth no. I, I, I talk about this briefly, but, you know, 1871 with the Commune is not this isolated thing, right? It's part of this whole decades-long kind of, you know, there, there are these periodic uprisings that happen in Europe either, you know, pro-democracy or, as, as Christoph said, like Jacobin or communist or whatever you want to call it. So it's a time of, you know, pretty major revolutionary activity. But anyway, so we have these, these modernizing processes, liberalizing processes in both of the countries. But on paper, it looks amazing. In practice, there are all of these things that come out of those, those processes that are unintended consequences. And there's a new system that replaces an old one, which brings its own problems. So, uh, you know, like what Kristaps was just mentioning about how in Russia, there's a class of people, you know, the, the nobles who end up, even though the serfs are emancipated, their land, you know, the, the patterns of who controls the land doesn't really change that much. You know, you mentioned the, the one Russian noble who buys an entire village, right? And I think if there's a parallel to that, in the U.S., at least in the, the northern states, it's this new class of industrialists who end up becoming enormously powerful. You could really make the case that there's this parallel system of government, which is either heavily influenced by corporate interests or, you know, in some cases, uh, completely controlled by them. And uh, this is something that takes place, it really takes place in the 18, late 1860s after the Civil War, but, uh, you know, it continues all the way up through the early 20th century in the U.S. If that's our parallel to the nobles, you know, this class of industrialists, of which the most powerful are the railroad interests, the parallel to the serfs would be industrial workers in the North. And um, this is a class of people that was never really part of the plan. Uh, in the U.S., there was this idea that America would always be a classless society. And the idea that there would be this permanent class of wage workers um, was something that was really abhorrent to people. This was something that had to be avoided at all costs. Yeah, by the way, uh, I, have a, I have an important question here. Yeah, sure. How long was the average workday of a factory worker in the United States before the strike? Yeah, that's a great question. And it actually varies depending on the industry. So um, 
Oh yeah, over here as well, because uh, you know I, th this is an important thing t for people to understand to kind of feel this. I mean, oft oftentimes people feel like eight hours a day, you know, it comes the final hour and you're already tired and everything. Well, in in Russia by this point, if you were if you weren't if you were just this field worker uh, who just rents his work for some bigger farmer or or a guy who owns the farm. In summer, you had to work for like 16 hours per day. Right, so days that long were actually not unheard of for industrial workers in the north. For agricultural workers, you know, sun up to sun down is, is pretty common. In the 1860s and 70s, it's not uncommon for industrial workers to have uh, 10, 12, 14 hour, 16 hour days were not unheard of, but very rare. You know, in 1886, there was this huge national strike for an eight hour day. And uh, I, was, I was reading that one of the, in one city, I think this was in Chicago, but like the... Oh my god, I've made who, another mistake. It's not Alexander III who actually <laughs> fought in the Russo-Japanese War, it's Nicholas II. Whoops. Well, really? sorry. How? I, I can't uh, even jump into this stuff. We'll get it in editing. Never mind. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave this in. Let, let them hear that I'm not, not fine and dandy all the time. But anyway, uh, on this one, for guys who worked on the streetcars in Chicago, their days were actually 17 hours, and their big win in 1886 was getting it reduced by 5 hours to 12 hours. So this whole idea about an 8-hour day is something that was uh, that it had to be fought for, you know, in some pretty major uh, political and labor battles over the years. Um, so this was a hard-won achievement, that 8-hour day. 1877, though, um, the strike begins with railroad workers, and... Um, you know, they tended to be doing some of the most dangerous and lowest paid work in the entire country. For them, you know, among this whole set of ex exploitative working conditions, one of those was the hours. And, uh, you know, that really varied depending on the run that they were doing. A day of 10 or 12 hours was certainly not uncommon. You know, among these workers, and I would love to hear some kind of parallel with, you know, serfs in Russia about this, the whole question of organization and how these people come together to launch some kind of a movement is a really interesting one. And uh, in the States, the basic unit of organization was not really a political one. Um, before the 1870s and you know, up, up through the end of the 19th century as well, it was really centered on unions. And uh, the battles of these unions, which you know, varied in size and scope and you know, who they would accept in part of their membership, the battles of these unions you know, against their employers was kind of the, the organizing paradigm. So you talk about blame and who people who are exploited in the system blame for their troubles. And in the States, the blame that workers placed on their employers and the fact that there was this sometimes, you know, really visceral kind of hatred that they felt for the people in charge of their companies was really the, the kind of us versus them mentality. You know, that, that was the, the workers' side of it. Occasionally, it was directed against politicians and political parties, but before 1877, that wasn't really a huge part of it. It was much more directed, you know, on the part of workers, uh, much more directed against employers, especially the, you know, what were called the robber barons, although they called themselves caps, captains of industry. But it was really directed against, like, specific personalities. Over here, it's, uh, it's a bit weird. There are some similarities, and well, there are some weird things. For example, Alexander III... Uh, the, the way how he oppressed things was that, for one, he kind of began or kind of renewed his secret police, and he tried to spy on is there uh, or spy on any possible socialists out there, because by now the serfs who got freed and couldn't buy off their farms they just went and became factory workers. They just instant boom of factory workers, and then you need factories, and he also kind of established more censorship and 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 like stopped the the. The, the right of meeting, I suppose. I don't know how is that called in constitution. The the kind of guaranteed freedom where you're allowed to meet with other people and discuss things publicly. What what's the official English term for that? I don't know. The word the worst interesting thing is that what he did is that by this point, unlike your country, you're basically by un, un, unless we're speaking about the western parts of it, you're all Americans, right? By 1877. Well, sort of. You you all think you're Americans. All yeah, right, on paper, right? everyone has the same rights. Yeah, absolutely. Well, over here, um, over here, Russia had expanded in Siberia, where native tribes lived, 
Now, one thing that they didn't do, they, 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 there was no genocide against native tribes. They just went in there, planted their flag and said, well, you serfs now. And then, then that happened. By the point of, uh, of ascension of Nicholas II, Russians were only 43% of Russia. And it had happened and previously, and Alexander Zedek he also noticed that there was this problem that people over there in the Far East, yeah, they, they don't speak Russian. And they have, they have problems with this even in modern day, because Russia has to send from Moscow centralized like inspectors to go and check if, if the people in Tumen village somewhere there are actually learning Russian. Therefore, a lot of people kind of thought I was joking when I said that a lot of people learn to read and write and speak Russian in the Soviet army, but, but no, that really happened. So this, this idea was that the, he, they started to kind of Russia, Russify everyone by, by the point, by the beginning of this revolution. So there, this wasn't, like I said, and again, all this time, like all these things happen, there's a absolute monarchy going on there because nobility has been curbed. And it's quite, quite absolute. But no one blames the Tsar at all. So we come to the 9th of January or, or 22nd January. They like uh, for it's 22nd January in uh, everywhere else in the world, but it's 9th of January in Russia because different calendars. So so some factory workers in St. Petersburg decide that, you know, enough is enough. They'll, they'll have a strike or something and they'll just, you know, they feel oppressed by, by the guys who run the factories, who are most likely nobles, because you have to be noble there. So about, uh, about 150,000 workers declare that they are going to go on a strike. But what they do in this one is something that would be really alien anywhere else. They calmly go to the Winter Palace to kind of give the Father Tsar a petition, <clears throat> precisely all submitting and requesting a petition, asking asking the Tsar to give the nation, give, give the people like give the people the voting rights essentially so that they could they could maybe vote for their local dumas or something they didn't want to topple the czar no no no. they also asked for an eight hour work day and then like improving the completely utterly zero right status of, of standard workers because when people are because they're no longer serfs that doesn't mean they have literally any guaranteed rights now, the, the person who kind of marched in forward of all of this, because Russia is very, very orthodox, and they're very religious, is a certain priest, orthodox priest, Gapon, who, and while they're marching there to give this petition, very calm and obedient petition to the Tsar, asking the kind Tsar to meet him in person, because Tsar is always good, and it's the, it's the nobles and his advisors who are evil. So these guys walk, walk peacefully there, and they're carrying these orthodox icons with them. And also, quite a few, like, pictures of Tsar himself. Most of Russian workers at that point really believed in the Tsar, and, and they hoped that the Tsar would kind of, you know, accept their, their demands. At that point, socialists were actually a very, very tiny minority of everything by, by, this, by this period. But Tsar Nicholas II proves that he isn't as capable and a, a leader as possible, nor is he a gentle ruler. Even though in later periods it might seem... Like, if you, if you skip th right through to the Bolshevik Revolution, which people often do, and skip the Revolution of 1905, it seems like the Nicholas II were just this timid man who didn't want anything evil and everything. Well, no. Actually, no. He wasn't that peaceful, and that's one of the myths that, that you have there in the West, as far as I've, I've heard from a lot of people. You see, Nicholas II just declares, oh, well, there are 150,000 strike people. Ah, uh, cops, cops, soldiers, everyone. Just fire at them. So, the, so nothing good happens, and the local soldiers just open fire without any question, and shoot down thousands of workers. Under, uh, and this is, this is another case of uh, only in Russia. According to official data, 96 people were died and about 300 were heavily wounded. 
and in reality the the people the amount of people who died was much much larger and there was a there was a latvian woman there who's who's we have, who's kind of witness whose kind of account we have from this era and and she she describes this as follows a first blast just a loud blast first loud blast was just shot at us and the first and all the first rows were just just lying down in blood and then they were just toppled their their limbs were just torn off of them and their brains were just everywhere and their comrades tried to help those who were wounded but nobody cared second blast from the cannons and another whole rows of, of bloodied people and then, after two blasts of th with cannons, cavalry just arrives and just topples over with horses those who are still wounded and living and chops, on, chops them off with swords until every, everyone kind of goes away. This is your timid, nice Nicholas II, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what happens later is that uh, quite obvious response, because the local government because you know there's Nicholas and then there's the doom under him and the fact that such brutality literally happened for people who were utterly peaceful now that caused literal rage throughout all of Russia even the calm calm peaceful farmers and peasants who had never rebelled up until this point from time of troubles to this this was peaceful okay so there is the saying that the bullets, uh, bullets next to the Winter Palace destroyed any belief in the Tsar. And by this point, spontaneously, spontaneously two things happen, which again are very, very, very similar to what happened in, in the United States, I think. As at this point, there are two, two kind of, two moves going on here. Oh yeah, and this this uh, demonstration, the first one which begins everything, it's called Bloody Sunday here. So what happens now is that there is this massive, massive rage, but there isn't one centralized movement there. It's just something purely from the instincts of the people. It's just radical, radical, random movement from one part. But there are some tiny organizations with some programs going on around here and there. But weirdly enough, they're mostly democratic. They're social. If they're if they're socialists, they're like socially socially democratic by this point. It was it was really weird. So just weird things happen all all throughout Russia, and I'll I'll move on to this because uh, yeah, I find it kind of interesting because there was no spontaneous unification under a certain leader in 1905. It was just that what the fuck did just happen? And nothing like this had happened before. I mean, Russia, Russian czars had never been particularly kind to people. But yeah, this is this is uh, th this should give you a bit more understanding about why Nicholas II maybe wasn't as a nice person as it sometimes as he sometimes is portrayed. Hmm. I wonder what the reasons are for that. Uh, you know, the nice guy Nicholas kind of portrayal. Because, like I said, a lot of people. And uh, I've noticed even our colleague Sebastian Major uh, just mentioned him through with Rasputin and just skipping this part of 1905. It just tends to tends to be skipped over. Uh, I guess, yeah, I, I wonder why. Because I I guess one of the reasons might be because we think of you know the Russian Revolution 1917, socialists, communists. That's all we need to know. Um, but then the, you know this earlier movement, I guess in part because it doesn't succeed might have something to do with it. I, I don't know. That's that's an interesting one. Yeah, because even though... By, and by the way, by this time, progress has actually been made in Russia. They have been industrializing a lot. They have been opening a lot of factories and their grain constant... The, the amount of grain that they're constantly exporting is rising. And actually, Russia is one of the kind of... They have one of the fastest economical growths in Europe. Well, because they were so far back, but still, they're really, really, really going on there. Yeah, it's like when you start working out for the first time and you make all those gains in the first couple of weeks. It's the same, the same thing with industrializing, I guess, because uh, you have so much ground to, to make up. Um, but uh, 
Yeah, did you want to say anything more? Well, actually, you know what? Let's let's follow through with this. So, no, it's gonna from... it's, it's gonna it's gonna end until this year. The 1905 wasn't didn't last very long. Because I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna finish this through. Sure. Yeah. Go uh, for it. Because it, it it ends up it ends kind of spontaneously. Because throughout throughout this period, throughout January until October, really. Basically, there are the, the people are just there are st- random strikes all over the place. Barricades on the streets of various towns and cities. Uh, cap cops are being assaulted. Uh, ass- assaults on on like these. I don't even know. Uh, like a palace, but smaller and with farm around it. We call it Moesia. It's like a a rich landowner's house, like an estate. Yes, estate. Woo! Got it. You remind me. I English goodly again. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, and this is interesting because a lot of these, like, it's basically random, whatever. Some people are organized, some people are not. Uh, soldiers and, and seamen just refuse to go obey orders. Uh, there are a lot of political murders around Russia. And weirdly enough, a lot of... Uh, like there are uh, in, um, in many many cities, these workers' councils uh, appear, just as happened in uh, St. Louis, if I'm not mistaken. Now wait, uh, what was it? I knew it. Yeah, St. Louis is the one where they go the farthest. Yes, 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 that one. Uh, there are other random, random thing. It's just that nothing really is very organized here, up until the October. Uh, by the way, interestingly enough, uh, this uh, random, random torching of estates that also happens here in latvian territory and uh, our our good fr- I, I i guess i've mentioned that at some point but edward Lieskalnich, uh, uh the guy who built the coral castle later he he personally killed his baron torched down his uh, torched down his distillery and you know was a general anarchist and that yeah it was, he he like he uh, he went away from latvia because um, he had to go firstly to England because he was very, very active in the revolution. But at one point, up until... up When this kind of comes down, when when because these councils and the cities, they, they kind of happen in, only in the late stage of this revolution because everything is... Ra- people are really trying to maintain some sort of order, but as nothing is really organized and as the revolutionaries are not unified, not, nothing much can happen except general chaos. It's not even a civil war, just, that, you know, it, Anarchy in the UK song playing in the background and then things just happen, basically. Now, at the end of this, somehow, an, an organization kind of comes down together, sort of. It, it's weird. Uh, a lot of, by the way, these demonstrations and, and weird things that essentially happen around there, they happen in churches, too. They're so-called church demonstrations. It's like everyone just goes to church and sits there for the whole day. Because down with the government, we're going to sit in the church. So various little, little, little kind of co- communes of, of kind of people who organize these things appear. And then they start organizing amongst themselves, finally. And they kind of, at the October, and this has been lasting for, what, nine months by this point. After nine months, they finally, finally decide what they want. They want a new constitution for one. They want a constitutional monarch to be in Russia. Has never happened before, mind you. No constitution there. And they want the, the rights to vote so that they, instead of the nobles, that the common people would get to call the Duma, essentially creating a parliament. And they wanted the so they, they also demanded the demanded the rights to be elected so that also non nobles could get elected. And, of course, they just demanded, you know, every basic human right that by this point you have in America, but not here. Completely not here. Now, Nicholas, by this point, and, and in the October, in the October starts all Russia, all Russia's political, political strike, essentially. Because everyone decides not to work, but this time let's do it a bit more organized instead of just, you know, going to the church at random. So, this happens in, in the beginning of uh, October, 
but Nicholas II decides that, you know, he can't really run, he hasn't been running a country for nine months by this point. So on the 17th of October, or 30th of October, we still have two dates by this point, he decides to, you know, kind of give in to the demands. He promises that if ev- he promises that if everyone comes down and then kind of goes back to the usual, then uh, they would get they would declare freedoms and certain rights uh, for rights for everyone living there. Uh, this, by the way, was called the Manifesto for the Improvement of the State Apparatus. And this was the first time where really some rights had been set for the common people. It declared that, you know, you couldn't be arrested for no reason, you could finally have, like, freedom of speech, you could have freedom of belief, you could meet with other people, and, and you know, you, you basically got very, very basic human rights. Uh, not everyone got the right to vote, but the voting rights were expanded. Now, it was kind of, it was thought that these new laws, which would give the rights to people, would uh, kind of make make that everyone kind of calms down. Now, there is this, there is this tiny problem that this is Russia that we're talking about. See, right after the manifesto is, has been proclaimed, mass violence erupts throughout all Russia, and this law uh, is, is instantly stopped and never renewed ever again. Because uh, for, so, for some reason, uh, these these there are there are certain rights and these uh, these people just say just think that instead of just come they have these new rights why should they go back to the factories so you know marauders looting and chaos just this time knowing that you know hey we got rights finally for the first time ever and you know because a lot a lot of times this has been compared to i don't know you you keep your dog kind of starving and in the cage and then you let him loose and you hope that he's gonna just stay in the cage. Oh, no, no, no. A lot of craziness just starts to happen. And this also ends the first kind of step of this revolution. Because this really can't last that much. Because uh, after a while, when this chaos just completely happens and it's, and it's crazy, it just happens for a while. But after that, the second period starts, which will last until 1907, where it's kind of the decline of this revolution. Because, you know, after a while, par- partially the moderate revolutionaries decide that, you know, uh, we got what we wanted. But the other part, which has, like, tasted some freedoms, decide that, hey, we need to continue going on with this. And there are kind of first political parties establishing in Russia. And three certain camps have been appearing. The revolutionary camp, who are essentially Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, which are the socialists, which by this point are called Russian Essers, which means socialist revolutionaries. You know, they always like to abbreviate things. And also, of course, the first Russian Socially Democratic Workers' Party. It's not Communistic Party yet. And yeah, Lenin is leading the Bolsheviks, obviously. Go Lenin. And then there are Mensheviks, who are kind of more moderate, and they just don't like Lenin in order. Then there are the liberals, who wanted like more of a more of a democratic government, who actually wanted something like in the United States. And these guys were called Octoberists, the, the Union of the 17th October, and Cadets, which were also known as the Constitutionally Democratic Party, who wanted a constitutional monarchy with very, with, with everything. And then there were just completely, completely through and through monarchists, who, for some reason, believe in the Tsar again. And they are also mostly supported by the nobles over here. Now, but as half of the revolution has gone away, and by this point, Tsar has decided to just screw everything, the punishment expeditions start. The the state of emergency is essentially declared. There are court-martials of, of uh, strikers, of farmers, of everyone. 
Tsar completely, the, uh, completely steps away from the manifesto of 17th October. Especially when it comes to the Ghost Duma, like the organizations. Essentially, uh, there is this very interesting system, which I don't know if has existed anywhere else, but these were very unequal. Unequal uh, voting rights there. Because, you see, you basically these... Uh, these estate holders, lesser nobility, or any nobility, they had one vote each. Three bourgeoisie guys, like three college-educated people, three just guys from like upper middle class, we would say. Three guys from that class equals one vote from the dude who owns the estate as nobility. That also equals 15 votes by the workers, and... 45 peasants votes. Also, uh, people, of course, women couldn't vote. Uh, no one under 25 could vote. Certain nations of Russia couldn't vote. And, remi and I remind you, Russians are a minority there. And weirdly enough, none, no one in the military. Which quite a lot of poor people went to, because you get to pay there. And after this, after this, kind of weird government, which is kind of there while the punishments are going on, and the punishments are really, really heavy and oppressive, uh, Tsar just declares, oh yeah, you know, we just elected you as a way to calm down, oh no, no, we're, we're just gonna cut all your rights again. So now the ministers are again appointed by the Tsar instead of this Ghost Duma, and basically, you know, just everything sort of meddles down until the last people around there are put down. Uh, a lot of people just uh, get sent away, mostly, or escape to Switzerland, for example, like Lenin, or, or some active people in, in Latvia. Some people just escape. Leaders escape somewhere else because they were among the first ones to be prosecuted this way. And in the 3rd third, third of June in 1907, Tsar decides that, hey, you know, I don't even need this rump of a costume anyways, and I have oppressed everyone there, and it's, it's, it's back to the good old days, and it shall ever remain this way, of course. Now, the total results of all of this wasn't, weren't as terrible as, as one might think. Because the decrease in workday and the increase of, of salaries actually remained. And peasants kind of uh, got lower rent, or if they wanted to rent their land. And they were kind of, the, the state essentially paid all of the, kind of, if you wanted to pay out your home, how your home you wanted to buy your house back from the, the state holder, then the government would do that now. You didn't have to pay anything. And slowly Nicholas II kind of approved the idea that, you know, we should make slight tiny, tiny movements to constitutional monarchy, even though he didn't like it at all. And the political parties who were there, who kind of were created during this revolution, oh, they stayed. This is where, actually, like, Bolsheviks appear. This is the beginning of Bolshevism, and that, that's just amazing. And they, they still remain. And they're sort of semi-legal in the gray state. And... Even though this Gosduma, the big one, is there, there are smaller, smaller city councils all around there. And just to make sure this never happens again, now, only after this revolution, there's a legal, legal permission to actually kind of organize into trade unions, into cooperatives, and various, you know, other groups of people. And by the way, and, and by the way, this, this, uh, the fact that people were now allowed to make just, you know, essentially fan clubs or just groups of people for, for a goal was the very beginning of Latvian independence movement, which started out as a <clears throat> society to help the poor Estonian families who have been ravaged by war. That's, that's where, the, under this guise, all the Latvian independence started coming up together. And censorship still existed, but, you know, you were a bit more allowed to say what you want, as long as you didn't say anything that would harm the Tsar. Like, you were allowed to criticize the lesser nobility, for example, now. And, finally, striking for economical reasons, for example, on the occasional case where your factory owner just didn't pay you salary for six months in a row, 
which by the way happened uh, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union too. There were periods over here where salaries just didn't get paid for months. Uh, yeah, you were allowed to strike officially back then. So some progress was made. A ton of people were dead. People didn't believe in Tsar anymore. And by this point, Nicholas II could have turned into the, the most constitutional monarch ever. No one ever really believed him after the bloody Sunday. And the fact that, you know, when something crazy happened and this kind of entered the culture of the nation was that, you know, it's happening again like in 1905. That stayed a, a local thing. So this is the birth of Bolsheviks and, and it, it kind of gained something at a cost of a ton of dead people. But I think it's kind of a... I think it's kind of a thing that there are small changes happening at a huge cost. And then nothing really much changes. Well, we, we'll have to wait for another uh, 10 years until change, sort of. But yeah, they achieved something, they paid it, they paid for it in blood. And we have monuments to the 1905 revolution everywhere. Because, of course, when Bolsheviks will come to power, they will glorify their own role into this revolution up to infinity. Basically say that everyone else who weren't who wasn't a Bolshevik was essentially a class traitor And yeah seeing this by the way uh, I mentioned in the first episode that one of the one of the things that turned uh, young Lenin into a radical and decided that you know This has to change was the hanging of his brother for the attempted assassination of Tsar Alexander the third and uh, most historians of the period think that witnessing this this blood all of this happening here turned the already aggressive boy and quite a wild child into really, really a, a person who would be ready later to just exterminate people en masse. Because 1905 marks the date where Lenin just starts writing in his memoirs and his notes about how terror is a legitimate strategy, we can do things through terror, and terror is now in Lenin's head just an ingrained part of any revolution that ought to happen and topple the Tsar and build socialism. He now thinks nothing can be done without terror. And due to the fact that he really wanted to be, he always wanted power, he always was power hungry. And I think that, you know, a lot of people also claim to this, other people just don't speak about it, but it's, it's quite likely that Lenin would have wanted to be the only supreme leader in this revolution, but it just didn't happen. But as he was raised as a spoiled kid, very aggressive too, he legitimately hated everyone in the other parties who were just revolting there. And the Soviet Terror made it so that they, the other guys who revolted, who weren't Bolsheviks in this revolution, were turned into kind of enemies of the state because they didn't obey Lenin, thus the communist revolution couldn't be, couldn't be realized faster. And that's a strange way to look at this. But yeah, this revolution is what the second huge nail in Lenin's career of becoming a mass murderer. Then again, he had his fair share of um, czars to thank for that one. Wow. Well, uh, thank you for that, you know, really comprehensive summary of what goes on in 1905, because I knew kind of the, the bare outlines of this, basically the Wikipedia version of the event. Yeah, I feel like I just learned a hell of a lot about that. And uh, as you've been going, I've been making a, a short list of like all the different parallels I see between the two events. And uh, I guess, you know, two of the ones that jump out at me the, the most would be, for one thing, the fact that this is a snowballing kind of event, right? The people who start this have limited goals and limited tactics, and there's this... Uh, dialogue that goes on. There's this back and forth between their demands, a sort of violent response to that, which then triggers, you know, violence in response. And then there's this back and forth that goes on until, you know, one side basically crushes the other. And that's one big uh, parallel I noticed between this and 1877. So, you know, one of the things that I, I find interesting about 1877 is that it's hard to find a label that really fits for it. The typical one is the Great Strike, but that doesn't really fit because, you know, although there are aspects of a strike to it, there's also all of this, um, you know, basically mass rioting, street battles, 
and then this revolutionary side to it as well. And all these things are going on simultaneously. And this ties into another parallel between the two events, which is that both groups, you know, the the revolutionary groups, if you want to call it that, are really seriously divided among themselves about, you know, what the goals are, how they're going to proceed, what the tactics are. And in the States, you know, the strike, uh, I guess we can call it that because, you know, some other labels involve like the labor uprising, which is kind of better, but, you know, still doesn't quite fit. But the strike anyway begins with uh, a small group of railroad workers in Maryland and West Virginia. And uh, it starts on this one line locally. They strike for better wages and a whole list of quality of life improvements. But then it spreads really quickly. And part of the spread has to do with the fact that, you know, there are these groups of workers who are striking and they tend to be, in general, uh, more peaceful, more disciplined, and have more limited aims and limited tactics as well, you know, towards achieving those aims than the other people involved in this movement. The major spread happens when in various cities across the North, uh, the major ones are Baltimore, Pittsburgh, a couple ones in upstate New York, like Buffalo, and uh, eventually Chicago and St. Louis, where basically you have large groups of industrial workers of all kinds who we think, because we don't have that much to go on in terms of evidence of them stating their motives, but uh, there are these large groups of industrial workers who take on the cause of the railroad men as their own. In Baltimore, what happens is that there's a unit that's called out, local militia unit that's called out to put down the strike on another part of the railroad line. And as they make their way to the railroad depot, they're met by these huge crowds of people who uh, attack the militia column in, you know, as it's marching through the streets. They throw stones, um, some of them have guns, and uh, you know, when the militia starts firing into them, then there's this street battle that triggers, and it leads to basically a mass shooting followed by the destruction of a lot of railroad property by people who are pissed off about this, you know, shooting taking place. And that kind of sets the, the pattern for other cities as well. Yeah, this is, this is, this is one of the very huge differences, because by that point, uh, this is really important, uh, what you mentioned on your show, is that the press played a huge role in this public opinion of what's, what's going on here. Nothing like that could happen in Soviet Russia, because all the... In the newspapers was like, you know, just later in Soviet, era, everything is calm and peaceful. Tsar is good. Cause... Right, although if, if, if there is one big parallel that I, I see in this phase of it, it's the fact that there's a Bloody Sunday kind of moment that happens in the U.S. And that, ha that happens in Pittsburgh. Now, it's not anywhere near on the same scale as the one that you talked about. In fact, you know, the scale of the events in the U.S. are really compressed. You know, I mean, you say that the, the first phase of this revolution in Russia is nine months. Well, the whole thing in the States in, in 1877 takes place in about two weeks. So it's really heavily compressed. Every single day in this is very important. Yeah, but, but you have to also remember that Russia is vast. Even if they wanted to control every, everything and everyone, that wasn't going to happen. That barely can happen today. And, and, uh, yeah, one one thing that I noticed is that I remember you speaking about the very the most radical of all the radical guys who were in these meetings and in these public things. And interestingly enough, I kind of kind of look at it this way because I look at that in a way that what your American radicals were speaking about that actually kind of happened in 1905 in Russia. It's weird that yeah. way. Like in terms of what the, what they were asking for, because in in the states, uh, just to give a little framing for uh, for the eastern border listeners, the radicals in this movement, you know, the far fringe of this, are probably more or less moderate in terms of the the spectrum in Russia in 1905. Well, they're no Lenin. this, uh, yeah, but uh, anyway, it's it's a small political party called the Working Men's Party of the United States which after this event uh, rebrands itself as the Socialist Party of the United States. Which is, which, which is very interesting because by this point, in 1905, there is no Socialist Party of Russia, there is no Communist Party, there are still Social Democrats, technically. So, Socialist Party of, of the United States happens faster than in Russia. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I think they, they, they organize themselves uh, surprisingly early, too, like it's... Uh, 1876, I think. So it's like a year before this event. So it's a brand new political party. They have about 
5,000 members, a little less actually nationwide. Um, so it's this, this little tiny fly speck of a political movement. But they have one big advantage in 1877, which is that they are the only ones who are speaking to the needs and grievances of American workers. Because basically at this point, both major political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, really can't claim to represent industrial workers at all. Both parties are very much parties of big business um, in different ways. So the, the yeah, I think I, I think that that's because, by the way, uh, because by this point, the American worker already knows what he wants. He has he has some needs that he knows, and and he has this idea of parties representing him. I think that you know, Lenin Lenin would love to be in this position of work, working man's party, but he really couldn't because I don't think that you see it took nine months for even the basic kind of. Anything besides, hey, let's ask Tsar for some basic rights. Uh, there were many ways to go because you know they had nothing literally. So that kind of, uh, I, I think that that certainly played a part of why 1905 revolution was so chaotic in Russia, because they there were they the kind of the political self consciousness of uh, the workers in Russia hadn't yet been born, it was born in this revolution, while the strikers who walk, who walk into these massive strikes in 1877, they already have some political consciousness that they can, you know, they can have. They know that they are, they are political power, sort of, and uh, this working men's party just basically activates it. There's something to activate there. Right, and among the, I mean, there's a real split among what different speakers in these huge rallies that get called in major cities, like in New York, Chicago, there's kind of a spectrum even among the radicals about what's being called for. But, you know, that is an important point that you make about the political consciousness, because one of the big talking points among these guys is basically saying, you know, you as workers have to become aware of the fact that you have this, this massive political power if you organize as some kind of block, right? And if you all use the power that you have at the ballot box, which is, as you pointed out, is very different from the way the Russian voting system works um, that they have, however, briefly. Um, one thing that they're not calling for, though, with one exception, which I'll get to in a minute, is um, any kind of overthrow of the government. Because the, the demands, even from the Working Men's Party, are fairly uh, moderate, I guess, compared to what you might see, you know, compared to an event like the Paris Commune, right? Because they don't call for the overthrow of the government. Uh, they call for people to take political power and organize and use the existing system to uh, promote their own interests, right? They also call for things like government ownership of, of railroads. They call for shorter working hours, a bunch of uh, workplace reforms. Uh, but there's no call for revolutionary violence. The one exception to this is St. Louis, where for about 24 hours, a committee of workers takes control of the city. And a lot of these guys are also members of the Working Men's Party. They take control of the city and they run it as a commune for about 24 hours um, before they get completely crushed. This ties into one of, actually, you know, the more I think about it, I think this is the most interesting part of the whole event is that parallel to this workers' movement, this popular, you know, spontaneous uprising is a counter movement, which is also a popular movement, which is um, made up of regular people, not people in government or positions of a special authority. But it's made up of ordinary people who live in the middle class neighborhoods and the rich parts of town in these urban areas. And what they do is organize a, their own spontaneous counter movement, which is designed to basically provide the force that the state and local, um, like uh, federal and local military and law enforcement groups are not able to provide. 1877 is very much a moment where American communities in these urban areas split down the middle. They essentially go to war with one another for, you know, anywhere from a few days to a couple of weeks. And um, the fact that this is spontaneous on both sides, I think is really interesting and uh, maybe has the most to, to tell us kind of as a warning, you know, today in the States, I think. Um, these people on the other side, on the side of these... Uh, spontaneous militias and paramilitary groups that form to oppose the strike. These are people who are mostly just scared that there's this violent movement that's going to come through into their neighborhoods. Um, they look at the Paris Commune, they look at the other revolutionary movements across Europe, 
that have been going on for the past few decades, and they think, well, it's happening here. One of the one of the stories that I like the most about this is uh, Louis Louis uh, Brandeis, who goes on to uh, become Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in a few decades, joins one of these units when a brick gets thrown through his family's window. He decides that, well, you know, that that does it. I gotta I gotta join up. But other guys, you know, from the accounts we have, join up basically just saying that, you know, we're we're frightened that things are going to get violent and our neighborhoods are going to be destroyed. But embedded in this is this understanding that there is this class divide in America. There's this class consciousness on both sides. And both sides fear and eventually, you know, grow to hate the other side as well, which is uh, another big outcome of this whole thing. Yeah, because th there really can't be two sides in Russia by this point, because like I said, it's 97% versus the 3%. And and there can cannot be like some people do want working within the government. Lenin definitely does not want working within the government because and this is one thing that I want to touch upon is that what Lenin always declared that communist his communism and socialism was a dictatorship of the proletariat. Now this later gets adapted because uh, like for example in in. Uh, East Germany, they would toss in also intel intelligentsia, the intelligent guys. But in Russia, it was always clear that it would be a complete and total dictatorship by the farmers and the by the farmers and the factory workers. So, in a very weird way, these guys were considered way more loyal than, for example, some some people from from the cities, and and that's that's why they were not very loud. And it's kind of. It's kind of interesting when you think about it, because a lot of people these days equate socialism, and socialism has grown, obviously, in meaning, but a lot of people these days equate socialism with this complete equality for everyone. While that is truly kind of not the case. Sure, it at the end, it becomes equality for everyone, but at least according to Lenin, this equality can only come when the proletariat and the agrarians, they take the power, and then they literally murder everyone else. And and then think about it how how all this has changed a bit, because I doubt that modern day socialist uh, leaning people would like to murder everyone who's not a socialist. Yeah, I I don't think so. They seem like the uh, kind of the nice guys in general. It seems like most of the uh... Well, you know, I can't really think of anything today, and not in this country anyway, that calls for that kind of exterminationist stuff. But, you know, in the aftermath of 1877, and th this is another big parallel I see with Russia, there is like a hardening of lines, right? Both sides understand that tactics need to become more radical, more violent. At least that's, that's true with Lenin. But uh, in one of these countries, those things come to fruition, and in the other one, they don't. And one, one of the things that actually confuses me about 1877 that I would like to learn more about is why, with all of this superheated rhetoric on both sides, which basically, you know, especially on the part of people who were anti-strike, anti-socialist, anti-labor, whatever, um, essentially saying that we need to use, you know, exterminationist tactics against these people. We need to uh, uproot them, we need to uncover them, and we need to remove them from our society by, in, you know, one means or another, whether that's violent or nonviolent. But, you know, that never really happens in the same way that it does in other countries, right? Maybe one of the reasons is that the states never experiences the same kinds of shocks in terms of something that reveals the basic incompetence or weakness of the government in the same way that losing the war against Japan does in 1905, right, with Russia. Well, I think that this is kind of also rooted in the Marxist ideology. Because, for example, the Americans were kind of more eager to go go to the way things were, because they had something. They had certain things they could, they could lose, even as little as they had. While technically, even Marx himself writes that the revolution can only come when everyone has been driven to utter poverty. Because only then you would totally devote yourself to the revolution. And I, th I think I think it's that kind of way because because in a in a very twisted and a weird way, uh, the fact that I think also the fact that some some of your some railroad companies really did kind of talk with talk and make deals with with the workers, right? Well, that that I suppose also gave hope. Uh, some of them did. Some of them did. Uh, but in eighteen seventy seven, the majority of them did not, and the ones that did were actually 
you know, slammed pretty hard by other companies and by the press. Yeah, I, it's, it's kind of weird. By the way, interestingly enough, uh, the, the railroads and the way that they happen in the United States really happened in the same quantities and the mass industrialization of Russia only happened in Stalin's era, by the way. It never was as big. Because Stalin essentially industrialized Russia completely. They started it, but but then civil war and, and uh, other issues, which we'll talk about uh, some other time. But yeah, this is it's kind of kind of interesting. Uh, you wouldn't happen to know what the, the people in the United States thought about what was going on in 1905 in Russia. In 1905, I'm not sure. Um, I know you know a bit about the the response to 1917, which was not good, but. Uh... As far as 1905, no, I'm, I'm actually not sure. So, I don't know, I, I would like to kind of... Then again, uh, in the early days of uh, 1917 and, and later even, there were actually, and th you'll find this very surprising, but we have quite a lot of uh, witness accounts from the early days of the revolution and, and even up to, up to Stalin's era, in, during Lenin's time in power, there were American workers just going to, to the Soviet Union and working there and then just going back this this has happened so I don't know then again Soviet Union started funding every socialist party on the planet earth after that point so I, I, I suppose it, it doesn't matter that much but it, it's kind of kind of weird how we're moving moving towards this kind of this, this middle ground of everything I suppose these days like where where the modern where the modern world has advanced and it really has grown from from all the all this all this chaos down there because because this is this is something that happened for the basically you know eight, okay eighteen forty eight but this is again this one point where where people are being oppressed right now I mean today the closest thing that we've got to something like this is Occupy Wall Street movement yeah that's nowhere near though. <laughs> So I, I, I agree that there, there are no real, not much in the way of parallels for this right now. What I do think is a, a parallel to the modern world and what I think is, you know, why I think this story is so relevant is that, you know, what happens in, uh, in 1877 is basically a spontaneous uprising against a changing economy. What work means and the way people work um, how much they're paid for it, how they organize themselves. All of this is undergoing massive, massive change in the 1870s. And there is this, you know, a new system is emerging in which there are big winners and there's a lot of big losers in this. What, what we're doing now, though, is we're coming out of the other end of that, right? So, you know, the entire system of work is changing in the U.S. now as well. But instead of industrialization, it's deindustrialization. So the fact that there could be some kind of spontaneous uprising against that, I think is not, depending on how bad things get, is not really out of the question. And so in this event, we have an interesting kind of, you know, potential blueprint for what that might look like or what some of the patterns in that might be. Um, I'm wondering, as you discuss 1905, and you know, you, you have a reason for wanting to tell this story, you know, if you had to tell your listeners, including, let's let's say, you know, a majority of American listeners, too, who might not know that much about this event, you know, what's your elevator pitch for that? Or like, you know, if we're in a bar, we're drinking, you mentioned that you're doing something about 1905. I say, what the heck is that? Um, what's your what's your short version for why people should should know about this event? Well, I'll tell you why. And that is a solemn warning for everyone out there. You see, when very educated elites, and well, if the more educated you get, it's kind of they tended to get be liberal because uh, it was it was very fashionable to be liberal in the higher society. And these super elites of Russia, they were thinking that they cared about about the common masses. They wanted to improve their lifestyles, and they were sitting in their elite bubble and and sitting down and thinking hmm, you know, maybe we should do this small reform or, or that small th and everything like that. And they were sitting in this bubble, very elitist, very noble, and very, 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 very uh, thinking of themselves that they're, you know, they're the paragons of civilization. They're like just the French and everything else. So when you think that you are... And then they really couldn't understand why the masses hated them. 
because there were still nobles and they were just, you know, not working but spending their leisure time in saloons, chatting with each other and thinking, hmm, yes, we are so great, educated and liberal. Now, what, how, how should the common masses do? And trying to decide for the common man how to act, you know. Sitting in a, in a very highly educated, wealthy thought bubble and just thinking about how these other, other people feel and thinking that you know best for them might lead to very disastrous results. That happened before. Thousands of people died in the beginning. Then there were then there was millions too. That's good. <laughs> that's that's a great pitch. If you had to recommend one book on this subject that uh, in, uh, listeners could find in English, what would oh, it be? Oh boy, you want something in English? Huh. <laughs> so I can read it. Yeah, oh. absolutely. I don't think I have any books in English. This is a this is a surprising question for me because you see I, I I have acquired a lot of them, but oh wait I do have one by the way um, in English which I which I've been reading which I'm still reading. It's not about the revolution though, but it's a great book which has been which is kindly it has been sent to me by the way from the United States by Prof C J mind you. And this is called Unfree Labor, American Slavery and Russian Serfdom by Peter Kolchin. Oh, I'm reading a book by him right now, actually. Yeah, he's really good. Because, uh, yeah, Prof. CJ gave this to me, and, and uh, I'm, I'm reading it right now. Because <clears throat> uh, another behind the scenes for the listeners, at one point you just don't want to read anything about the Soviet Union for a while. I can, yeah, I, I definitely get that. My, my, like, like I have, I have this bookshelf at home, and then there's Alice's books about like knitting and and, and doing things for her university, and, th this, <laughs> and that's, that's this, that's this tiny. And they're really, really closely packed together, and then, th then comes the books starting about Stalin, then comes Lenin uh -huh. and everything else, because, because I, I I happen to have too too many of them by this point. Well, you got to find that balance, I guess, the knitting and the Stalin on the either no, side. No, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I like, I like all these things. For for these, for these series, mind you, I'm taking a relaxing, relaxing attitude. Um, I'm watching a lot of Russian documentaries about Lenin, but as historical documentaries tend to have only Kino Chronicle running around or some historians sitting down and talking, that means I can play Hearthstone while I'm researching stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, because. All this 1905 thing, it gets unnecessarily skipped over, and it, it forms Lenin to who he is, and after this, he will go into Switzerland for a while, and we won't see from him, he'll, he'll be there and he'll be doing his work, because he's doing a lot of traveling by this point, and, and he'll, like Dan Carlin mentioned in his uh, blueprint for Armageddon, uh, he'll end up living in uh, in the ne in the upper floor of a sausage factory. So it's it's all very weird, and when I'll get to it, because uh, you might think this is only gonna be about what happens in Russia and the Bolshevik Revolution, but no, during the collapse uh, during the collapse of the Russian Empire and the end of the First World War, many things happen around too, and I'll be talking about the independence of uh, the Baltic countries, Poland, civil war. It's it's. Uh, crazy and a lot and it's crazy and weird and yeah well i suppose well we're gonna have to have another conversation when, when i'll get to the soviet civil war like the whites versus the reds which is amazing except you know the reds won oh and then there's one question which i want to ask you personally why the colors of the parties are inversed in america the reds are socialists Oh, so like, why did the Republican Party ha party has a uh, you know like the red states versus the Democratic blue states? Yeah, because it's it's the opposite. Of everyone else, I I'm sure I've asked you that at one point or something. If I've asked you, just to cut it out. But I I don't know. It's just uh, yeah, right. I did ask you, but you couldn't really give me a solid answer. Well, maybe you know. Maybe you know now. Uh, you know, I didn't look into that, but let's find out actually, because I'm very curious about this one. Yeah. So um. So the article I'm looking at says that it comes from 1976, which is surprisingly late, actually. I thought it was earlier. But um, it had to do with the, I guess, when NBC was reporting on the election that year, they used that color scheme. And it was. It says it's based on uh, the British political system, in which red was the more liberal party. 
why they had that color scheme, I couldn't tell you. Although, actually, I guess that makes sense because of the the Reds and socialism. And you know, like Br- British British are, are always treated as the weird, weird, weird people of Europe. I mean, everyone else, normal, codified civil law, Napoleon came over, got a civil law, we actually thank Napoleon for that. No, you guys have common law. Everyone else decides, hey, metric system is really cool and makes sense. Nope, you have to have Imperial. And everywhere else is like, blue is for the right-wing parties and, and red is for socialists, because socialism is, is red, it, it makes sense. Nope. It's the other way around for the United States. It's like you're trying to be... It, it must come from some sort of anti-European mentality, really. But even though I kind of I kind of would think that you would run on on the metric system instead of the instead of the imperial one, because you know you got independence from the British and the French were your friends, but you kept it the same way anyways. Hmm. Well, I don't know. Maybe the French Revolution does have something to do with that because uh, you know at the time there was one political party in the states, the Federalists, which really wanted to completely you know avoid any kind of influence like french influence revolutionary influence in the states because you know this was during a pretty you know new and unstable time for the political system so i guess that might have something to do with it as they they were actually very anglo-friendly uh the federalists people like alexander hamilton and then war uh, and then war of 1812 happened (laughs) (laughs) yeah well that too well you know there was a big push by some of the folks in the northeast actually where i live to uh you know, potentially separate from the rest of the country over that war. So, um, maybe that's, a, you know, another potential episode for the future. Yeah. Uh, what I want to ask you, though, actually, is why red is the socialist color? When did they when did they pick that, and, what, you know, what's the association? I think it comes from the Marx already, because the color red is associated with the blood of the workers unjustly spilt and, like, exploited and everything, and they take it up as their flag to get the power. Hmm. So Marx was the one who proposed that? I I think so, because it was already there by the time of Lenin. It was there already in 1905. It was, it was there, so I believe it, could, it should come from, from Marx himself. Or, or it just arrived very early, because uh, I, I know what it represents. It represents these, these whole soldiers. And the star, kind of, uh, sickle and hammer represents the union between factory workers and the farmers. And the st- and the star is uh, the bright is, is you know you look at the bright shiny glorious future that that lies ahead and it's paid for by the red blood of, of all the all the socialists and proletariat and everything mhm you know now that i think about it one thing that has changed since the 1870s in a big way is that um you know around the time of the paris commune is where that word socialist becomes a really dirty word in the us and that fear of socialists and communists becomes a huge deal after, you know, 1877 and, uh, you know, with the, the labor battles over the decades following that. And then, of course, with the Soviet Union, you know, it, it intensifies and during the Cold War, you know. But uh, I feel like in the last couple of years, really, the word has lost a lot of its um, negative connotations in the States. Well, the Russia still has communist party. They're not socialists. Over here, we had a socialist party, which were remnants from the Soviet era, and now are very pro-Russia. So, what is a socialist means very, very, very different things throughout the world by this point, as far as I've noticed. And, for example, you will not exactly find a socialist party in Sweden, but Sweden is a very interesting case. They live in socialism, and they, they have an effectively a single-party system for many, many, many years now. They have multiple parties, but there has been just one single leading coalition for a a huge period of time, which consists of tiny, tiny, tiny parties just banging up together. And they just, you know, at one point, they have this party union, which will lead the country, and everyone knows that. It's just that how the little minor parties will get split into that one. That that happens there. And and that's that's also their socialism. And um, it, it just... See, when a word gets overused after a period of time, it just loses its its threat and its meaning. And that is why, by the way, and this is a you can leave it in, you can leave it out. But this is this is why I object by 
comparing everyone to Hitler and saying that everyone is a Nazi. Because once you do that enough times, people who it'll it'll get used by people who don't know what the Nazis actually did, and and it just will lose it lose it will lose its significance. It will not it will no it will stop being effective. I don't think that you know. Okay, we need we need villains, and and we need some symbols that represent like ultimate evil. But comparing and by this point, uh, you don't call mass murderers like Nazis. Uh, you like actual neo Nazis. They can be called Nazis. But when you call your political opponents Nazis because of their different ideas, then you know um, it's. It, it 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 has already lost some of its meaning, I think, and, and that's actually bad, I think at least. But for for example, previously before the Nazis, uh, as far as I know, people people tended to compare, uh, like in the First World War, Germans were the Huns, and uh, terrible terrible rulers were just like tyrants were called pharaohs. They were compared to pharaohs. Right now, they're Nazis and fascists, basically. Right, yeah, it, it is a kind of a catch-all term. Um, one of the things I talk about in the, the series is that if you're wondering in the States, well, why is socialism or communism such a, a dirty word, and when did that begin? Um, th this is when it happens. You know, the 1870s is really when it, that, that whole thing takes off. Yeah, but I don't, um, didn't really understand the fact of, okay, there, there was some violence on, on, on what well, the public opinion changed. I couldn't really understand why it happened. Because, you know, in Soviet Russia, it was like, we believe in Tsar, Tsar blatantly murders everyone a lot, then opinion towards Tsar changes. Over there, it was like a a squabble thing, and the forces of the railroad companies were the guys who, as far as I understood it, were the guilty party there, and the workers yeah, responded. Yeah, I, th I think that's fair enough. So, what what happened there? Well, uh, th okay, so yeah, that's that's maybe maybe I live in a completely different culture, and uh, it's kind of weird because I replayed Fallout New Vegas recently, and previously, you know, when I played it a few years ago, I tried to do things, you know, the proper good way. I've grown out of that that since, and I just played the game as I would want to play the game, and I was barely neutral all the time because I I managed to do all the good quests. But at one point, I just decided that, hey, um, stealing random stuff, which is just laying there, is the way to go, because uh, I need to save the galaxy, uh, and, and you are you are from what? From Van Graaffs? Oh, I'm gonna kill you anyways later. I'm um, gonna nip that laser gun. Mega evil person, I don't even know. That and I crucified Benny, because that was cool. <laughs> oh my god, uh... Actually, you know, if I'm thinking of, uh, if I am going to throw in a video game analogy to compare it to, I guess uh, maybe the best thing is that, you ever play that game uh, Alpha Centauri? I was born in 1989. I know Alpha Centauri. I'm the kind of guy who, I'm the kind of guy who waited for a remake of XCOM for 15 years. <laughs> Me too, actually. Yeah, I, I played the original uh, pretty heavily. But anyway, for for the listeners, um, so Alpha Centauri is this game where it's like humanity blasts off from Earth. Earth is dying. We colonize a new planet. Each of the factions that colonize this planet are based around an absolute kind of ideology of some kind. You have like a a, a hive mind. You have a uh, you know one that's entirely like based on these not so environmentalists. You have um. You know, all these different extreme kind of ideologies. And, uh, you know, what happens in the 1870s, this is a bit of a stretch, but people see that they're, they're basically afraid of American society turning into one of those extreme kind of versions. Now, that change never really happens, I don't think. But um, people are terrified that there's some kind of absolute revolution in values and system of government and everything that's going to take place. And it's going to become some kind of cartoonish, like either socialist despotism of some kind, or it's going to become, you know, on the part of workers, they're afraid that it's going to become this absolute kind of plutocracy. If you've played Alpha Centauri, they're afraid it's going to become like the Morganites, basically, where you have a, uh, you know, a company that is its own state, 
Right. The, the weirdest part the weirdest part is is that up until the end of World War Two, the socialism in the Soviet Union basically ran the way of come on, we must spread the revolution everywhere instantly. Because uh, the thought was that social the, the early socialists uh, and, and the communists there, like Lenin and Stalin, actually thought that, you know, so if if basically the whole world isn't socialist, then the capitalist countries shall unite against the socialist country and the country will collapse later. And then later became the socialism in one country and everything like that. This is why at the end of the Civil War they attacked Poland instantly. And and this is they, they wanted they lived on this world revolution thing and you know by the end of World War One it really seemed that everywhere was just going down at the same time. Well, that never really happened. And and running running towards a permanent this was a state of a permanent revolution. And at, at this point, I guess uh, yeah, it really kind of calms down in 1907, 1907 Yes, uh, because because yeah. Lenin is away. Not that much happened. Everything kind of goes back to normal. Rasputin appears more in the scene, uh, and and it it kind of starts starts happening. And uh, also, there's a lot of you know um, intelligence agencies involved from other countries there. But it, it is weird when I'll when I'll be talking about these seven years between the revolution. Oh, I guess I guess. Uh, I won't. I won't be talking about what happened in World War One. You have Dan Carlin for that. He did it better than I ever could. Okay, uh, but yeah, that, that's a really good series. <laughs> yep, uh, and these are the kind of years of relative peace. Actually, no, it is seven years be- be- between 1907 and 1914. It's kind of calm before the storm, I think, in, in a way, and and I believe that if we want to avoid massive bloodshed and revolts of everything, then fixing things... Like when, when they're in this period of calm before the storm, which I wanted to specifically emphasize, is that the Tsar could have done anything, completely everything. The seeds of the revolution were there, Lenin was already writing things, and he couldn't fix the situation anymore. So... When you think that you are the most satisfied about everything and everything is going completely smoothly, that's where you should really expect something bad to happen. And, and maybe again, it's our own culture because I sometimes I don't understand understand the American rebels. Again, this is this is by the way a popular joke around here because why why Americans didn't have socialism? Well, because they expected that socialism would be something great. I don't get it. <laughs> you guys, you guys always expect that things will turn out very great and awesome and nice. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, so the American we expect right? we expect to get punched in the nose every time we walk outside the door. Well, not literally anymore, but that that's the point. Uh huh. I I think that's that's actually really on the money. Um, even though it is a a Russian joke, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense because um. The, you know, in response to your question about like, well, why, you know, why wasn't there some kind of, you know, increased revolutionary activity is because people had faith in the system. Uh, Historians I've read on the subject love to talk about how after 1877, there was this big upsurge in like people voting for socialist candidates on like a local level. Um, There were a lot of working men's party candidates actually, who, you know, became mayors or I don't believe any of them ever became governors, but uh, you know, in a lot of local uh, government, they, they were actually quite successful for a bit. But it never caught on nationally um, because this was really, you know, there was a big split between industrial workers and farm workers. There never was that hammer and sickle moment where the two of them really got together, at least not in the 19th century. But um, the fact is that the majority of people, despite all this disillusionment, still voted Republican or Democrat. And they voted Republican or Democrat in huge numbers. After, you know, there were a few other big moments, uh, one in 1886, another in 1890. Two, 94. And then in 1896, actually, um, there's a movement, a farmer's movement called the Populist Party that actually succeeds in taking over, more or less, the, uh, the Democratic Party. So, you know, even though they lose that election, it does change the, the Democrats permanently. And the Republicans begin to have these reforms as well. 
Um, so I think in general, the big lesson from that is that in the States, I think people should probably stop holding out hope for a third party. I, I, I don't think that's really how political change, change happens in our system. Um, generally what happens is reforms, you know, that are pushed by people from below. Sometimes for, you know, it takes a really long time for this to happen, but uh, those can eventually find their way filtering up into the, the two major political parties. So reform from within rather than some kind of insurgent change from without, I think is usually how it goes, you know? And I think that's the big lesson of this stuff. The reforms that are demanded by all these different labor unions and labor organizations starting in the 1860s and going for decades, you know, about, about 40 or 50 years, eventually, you know, a lot of those do find their way into major party platforms. Um, and then of course, in the thirties with the Democrats, you know, and the new deal and everything, that's really when that stuff comes to fruition. But uh, I think if there is one sort of long-term lesson in American politics from this, this period, that's it. Hmm. Yeah. And this kind of made me think about it because when I compare to these, the two of these socialist movements, when you think about it, the the commune that that was there, who which ran the longest in St. Louis, ah, don't forget this, that was kind of their end goal, right? They they thought that by winning this strike, they would instantly be better. I, I think at least. Uh, and but Lenin ran with the idea that the workers' paradise will come eventually, and that things are gonna get much worse before they get any better. And that even though you might fight in a revolution, you still might die. And your children might die of starvation, but that's that's part of the deal. And that's kind of interesting, you think, because uh, people ran for this, and they were ready for it to get worse for a while, for then it to get better, sort of. Uh, but the thing is, they continue running, running with this. It's gonna get a bit worse, but it'll be better in the long term, long run all the way through the Soviet era, which is interesting. Right. Well, in the 18, uh, late 1870s and 80s, you know, the big workers group in the United States was called the Knights of Labor, and they were much more radical than the other groups that uh, dominated later on, like the AFL, the American Federation of Labor. Knights of Labor sound like such a... Knights of Labor, Such yeah. an oxymoron to my ears. Right. Well, originally they were like a secret society. Uh, the guy who was in charge had the title of like the Grand Master Workman. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they had all of these fancy names and I'll bet they had some secret handshakes too and stuff like that. But, um, you know, they were more radical than some of the, the later groups, which were basically focused on how can we make capitalism better, you know, nicer. The Knights of Labor rejected the, the system of wage labor. And, you know, they were very open in terms of who they would accept. They would accept people regardless of race, which was a big deal, uh, regardless of national origin, regardless of skill level. Um, and they got something like six or 700,000 members, was very successful uh, for a while. But what's, what's interesting about them is that not even the leadership had any idea about how they would replace the wage system or what would come after. You know, they knew that it sucked, but they weren't sure what they would put in place. So there was a lot of confusion about that. What, comrade, you just like you you just like the proper logic. It's just from everyone according to their abilities to everyone according to their needs. And then if you ask and then if you ask how is this possible, uh, then then you just you, then you just get arrested for asking too many questions and being a, an American spy obviously. Well, that's one way to do it. Um, Which, by the way, by the way, uh, interestingly enough, and, and leave this in because uh, okay. I, po I posted, I posted, uh, I posted a picture because I found the picture of uh, essentially 1985 list given out to um, tourists in English which is like the music which is not recommended essentially don't don't listen to this music and there are various bands for various reasons they're 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 banned and it's terrible like Pink Floyd is. Uh, not recommended and banned essentially because they're interfering with the foreign policy of the USSR. And I'm fixing the grammar here a bit because it's terrible English. Uh, for Sex Pistols, punk violence. Ramones, just punk. <laughs> so not anti communist. ACDC, neo fascism, violence. Mm, that's a problem. Genghis Khan, anti communism, nationalism. Talking Heads, Myth of Soviet military danger. 
And like I, I, I found this, and people people keep asking me questions about what does this mean, and I can't respond to this because it there are mistakes. For example, Black Sabbath is banned for violence and religious obscuritanism, hmm. spelled with a K. And then you start thinking, wait a minute, religious obscuritanism, but 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 how? And then and then I can't answer this. But then in this in this thread, I got I got this wonderful comment about the the logic and how is how is this going like and you know in the sixth and one listener's father apparently who had moved, who had later moved to the united states and the person is apparently an american citizen and he today told me that um, we don't need any of that bourgeoisie kulak logic back in the 60s one of the charges against my father as a soviet citizen was <clears throat> daring to say that there was no freedom of speech oh my god the irony you see, it's just that there's like this. This is one of the things that I love about this stuff. I mean, not you know in real life, just as a curiosity, is that there's there's such inconsistencies, you know, and like this total lack of self awareness. I, I find that really funny, you know, yeah, in this, a really grim and depressing kind of way. But it's 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 hilarious. And 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 I'll tell you one one very important thing, which is what I always try to try to remind everyone is that this whole thing. All the oppression in every totalitarian system, either Soviet or or fascist or Nazis or whatever, it can happen because it are you can you can't if you see someone else as a human being, you instinctively can't hurt them as bad unless you're a terrible sociopath. But if but this whole thing happens when you dehumanize people, and it's very easy to dehumanize people as a group, bourgeoisie, kulaks. Nor you liberal northerners, crazy southerner, whatever. It's it's looking at the individual that really should be the case here. I, I think at least we all like to belong in groups, but we should. But we really should remember that people on the other side are just humans. Even though there might be a huge amount of them, they might be really angry, and they want to topple the czar. They're still people, after all. And we tend to ignore the, the plight of, of the, the common guy there. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess, is, you know, is it possible to have that kind of, that individualistic, take people one at a time kind of thing, and also be a Marxist or a socialist or a communist? Because I, I don't think you can. Well, you see, a lot of people have... Marx had some idealistic ideas. At the same time, he had this idea that the institution of family should be abandoned completely, and that you know, children, that workers would be kind of they, they would have their own officers, and they would like live in these barracks, and it would be like total military command as well. It it's 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 a weird thing. It's essentially everything that we've been going through, and you Americans like to call yourselves this experiment in democracy, well, there have been plenty of experiments in various things. Well, let's hope th this democracy thing kind of works out. Why, why, how come every time we talk about anything with you, we end up discussing the, the moral philosophy of things? I don't know, I can't, I can't help it, man, that's the way it goes. <laughs> Because for it's both of our shows, it's about the ideas underlying these events, as well as the events themselves, so oh, yeah, I guess it'll, way, it'll I, tend towards that regardless. Wait a minute. Uh, for, for people, I, I always forget that this is going to be the first time my listeners hear you, not the second time. So, uh, yeah, I have to say that, you know, as I look at the Soviet, Soviet side of things, and I look at the mentality issues, and, you know, the identity questions of who made us, us, and Sam here does the very same thing with Americans, and... Um, you know, I presume when I listen to your show, you must feel the same. I feel the same way, like you're listening to mine, because it's like this. It's getting into this completely alien mindset and understanding what what makes it tick, and it's really, really interesting to me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess if there's one thing that uh, you know we do have in common, like listening to both shows uh, back to back, is that um, you know while there is that extreme difference between the two countries, the mentalities, the ideologies, myth, you know, national myths, whatever. Um, there are as well these interesting parallels between the two things. And uh, I think in this story we found a really interesting uh, comparison between the two. And uh, this might be a good place to wrap things up as well. 
Oh yeah. Well, next time I shall be taking this journey how... I'll be taking this nice journey next time about uh, how Lenin got to where... Got to this 19... Uh, got to 1905, and then from the end of 1905, uh, what he did in Switzerland. Up until his return. That's that's gonna be my next show. At least, that's 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 what's planned. And yeah, if you don't mind, dear listeners, and uh, this especially con- this especially concerns non-American listeners, and maybe American listeners too. I don't know, but uh, I I know all of my Swedish and Australian friends will be crazy for you, Sam. Uh, but go listen to Inward Empire. It's it's an amazing show, and uh, I really enjoy these conversations. And when we started recording, we 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 thought, okay, we have an hour. It's two hours by this point. Yeah, things do get out of hand when we talk to Christophs. And uh, for my listeners as well, um, just a reminder that uh, during those long intervals between my episodes, you really should be listening to The Eastern Border. And this current series about Lenin is, and you know, the, the, the Russian revolutions in the early 20th century is just so good. It's uh, a really crucial thing for, I think, anyone anywhere in the world to know about. It's one of the most important events in world history. So um, if you want to find out more about that, because I know it certainly wasn't a big part of my education growing up, uh, go check out The Eastern Border. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org for more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The Eastern Border salutes you. Great.